Good evening and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 150, which reads as follows. Atinang nakarang katang mangsa lohi talipanang yata jaraja matjuja mano makhoja ohito which means Nagarang, a city Atinangatang, a city made of bones Mangsalohi Talipanang, that is plastered with flesh and blood Yata Jaraja Machucha wherein old age and death Mano Mako, conceit and deceit, Ohito, dwell or are lodged or descend upon. I'm actually not sure about Ohita. Are lie, wherein lie. Uh, old age and death, conceit and deceit, conceit and treachery or crookedness. So remember, we're in the Jarawaga, I think, right? Jarawaga, which means old age. So these are all going to be about old age, death, that kind of thing, the body. They're not going to be very pleasant, most likely. They haven't been so far. This story... Um, another one of those memorable stories Most of them are fairly memorable And somewhat a fantastical story So if you're not a fan of the miraculous uh, bear, with, bear with it Because uh, it's not so much in the story It's much more in the lesson that it has So yeah, at any rate The story goes that This um, Buddhist nun, Rupananda, who is supposed to be the Buddha's cousin, or her step stepsister, sister-in-law, something like that, some relative of the Buddha, Rupananda, Rupananda. who was very beautiful. She was called Janapada, Janapada Kalyani, which means the beauty of the land, the most beautiful girl in the country. And she heard that, well, like many of the Buddha's relatives, everybody's becoming monks and nun monks, female monks, male monks. And so she said, like many of them, follow, let's follow along. She thought, well, hey, I'll do it too. Not really knowing or, or having any conception of, of what exactly the Buddha taught. And uh, quite quickly she found, uh, she became aware of the fact that the Buddha's teaching wasn't, didn't have much good to say about physical beauty that physical beauty is impermanent you know. it's impermanent, unsatisfying, uncontrollable it's a cause for suffering something that you shouldn't think of as me or mine it's a cause for ego, conceit which wasn't a very pleasing sort of uh, teaching for her and moreover it, it made her feel kind of um, nervous, she misunderstood that somehow the Buddha would look down upon her and uh, criticize her for being beautiful, right? Because beauty is a... she thought, she understood beauty to be a bit of a problem in the Buddha's teaching. But at any rate, well, perhaps, but at any rate, the whole idea that the, f that bod the body is impermanent, unsatisfying, uncontrollable, cause for suffering, a cause for ego, and so on. It's not really 
um, not really comfortable for her because she was probably quite pleased with her beauty and had received praise uh, from an early age about her beauty. As a result, had most likely gained quite a bit of conceit and uh, crookedness. Uh, you see where this is going. So she, she thought, well, rather than have the Buddha criticize me for being beautiful or, or you know, whether being, being, having my beauty diminished in some way or the importance of my beauty diminished, she thought, I just, I'll just never go to see the Buddha. And so she did whatever she could to avoid having to see the Buddha for, for quite some time. Fortunately for her, um, living in the monastery and, and with lay people coming and going from the, the female monk monastery, uh, she ended up hearing a good report about the Buddha. Well, to, to say that, to put it mildly, she began to hear all these wonderful things people were saying about the Buddha. How impressive he was, how profound his teachings, how enlightening it was, how, how amazing and marvelous it was just to see and, and to hear him teach, to receive instruction and to practice in the presence of the Buddha. To the point where, you know, reasonably, understandably, imagine being so close to the Buddha but having never gone to see him, she became uh, curious but interested and, and quite keen actually to see the Buddha. And it, she wrestled with this because it was quite serious for her that what he would say about her or the kind of things he would say would, would embarrass her or humiliate her for being beautiful or at the very least diminish the value of her beauty. But she said to herself, well, you know, suppose he were to talk all day about criticize, about, about how awful beauty is or, or how useless it is or how impermanent it is. How much can he possibly say, right? It's just words. So she said, in the end, she said, I gotta go see him. So she finally made up her mind that she would go to see and learn from the Buddha, listen to what he had to say, and, and hopefully gain some understanding. Everyone heard, of course, and they were all excited because, oh, something special. Rupananda, because they knew she'd never gone to see the Buddha, and they said, He's going to give a special teaching for her. This is going to be a special occasion. For the first time, she'll get to see the Buddha. And the Buddha himself, using his special powers, was able to think, or, or not able to think, thought to himself, I'll have to do something special for her. And so she sat at the back, kind of out of the way where, I don't know where she sat actually, I think she sat at the back where she wouldn't be seen by the Buddha and She said, I will not let him see who I am. And so she covered herself up and stood at the back. But there's no fooling the Buddha. And so when the Buddha, when the Buddha taught, before he taught, he used his magical, his special powers to create or to, uh, to control her mind in some way, to create a, an impression on her mind uh, that there was a beautiful woman behind the Buddha fanning him. Nobody else could see it. He didn't actually create this vision, but he somehow made her to see this exceedingly beautiful woman fanning the Buddha. In front of the Buddha, fanning the Buddha. This was a common thing. I mean, you're thinking, talking India, where in the hot season it can get quite hot. And they didn't have fans, for the, electric fans, obviously, for the teacher. And it was quite common for someone to stand, one of the monks often, to stand and fan. I've done it before. I did it for Ajahn Tong. Uh, would take his fan and fan him when there was an outdoor uh, ceremony and he had to sit for a long time and there was no fan. It's one of those great uh, gifts to a teacher. So it was a common thing. And 
uh, Rupananda saw her and, and was um, was shocked you know, he, because this woman was actually her beauty it says made made Rupananda look like a crow crows are not ugly but I, I guess the idea is something that's quite ugly I compared herself to a r r crow standing before a royal goose and uh, you know it interested at her because well here was another beautiful woman who who you know appeared to be quite close to the buddha and she seemed happy and so suddenly she started to pay attention and she lost her nervousness and started listening to what the buddha said and watching this woman and so the buddha taught but as he taught she would look back at this beautiful woman entranced by her beauty and she looked and suddenly the woman had aged. No longer a girl of 16, she was now a woman, perhaps a woman who had been through childbirth, it says, you know, lost a little bit of her youthful figure. And she thought, oh, that's, that's not the same as it was before. And so she was kind of confused and she kept watching and as she watched the Buddha caused the image to change further to a middle-aged woman and then slowly slowly the middle-aged woman became old and decrepit and bent like an a-frame they said you know, hunchback and she said to herself in the Pali idampi antarahitang this has disappeared that's disappeared Realizing, you know, the, the point the the text is making is, she she was able to see that, you know, this thing that she was clinging to, beautiful, beautiful, gone, beautiful, gone, ugly. <laughs> you know, realizing impermanence, you know, it's a very useful sort of conventional means of of helping someone cultivate impermanence. It's a construct or an artifice. And finally, as you can imagine. This crippled old, lady, old woman, suddenly the Buddha had her collapse. She, she gives out a large um, wail or moan or something and collapses on the floor and starts um, dying, basically, in, in great pain and suffering. And it says rolling around in her urine and feces. Imagine the sight. And then lying still dead. And Rupananda is just watching it with in utter amazement and uh, watches as the, as the corpse, now a corpse, begins to, well, quite much more, much quickly than it would in it naturally, of course, starts to bloat and break and liquid starts to pour out of all the open, all the orifices and then it breaks apart and pus and blood that comes out and maggots and so on and you know according to the progression of the corpse and you think well you know nice show but what does it mean it's, but I think it should be quite clear that the, the, the profundity of this is that this is us you know this 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 is a so what she's seeing is a story of life. This isn't some um, hypothetical. It's perhaps the, the the vision that is the most reson that resonates the strongest with a human being is the vision of old age, sickness, and death. And it resonated with her, and she 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 realized, you know, this beauty that she had. I mean. Obviously, she's not going to age that quickly, but it's going to come to her as well. This is exactly the fate that she will, can one day hope for or expect for. And so, I mean, this isn't vipassana exactly, but it's a great samatha practice that we use often, while looking at dead corpses. But um, the idea is that it, it really sets the stage, it really prepares one for an understanding of true impermanent suffering and non-self because it makes you a lot more objective about the body. You lose a lot of the conceit 
all of the crookedness surrounding the body, you know, using your body, thinking that people are attracted to your body and uh, finding ways to make up your body, clean your body, primp your body. You feel strong in the body, we do physical sports and exercises to try and make the body more competent, more able, more potent. We eat foods and so on. Or maybe the opposite, maybe we loathe our body and we feel disgusted, we feel self-conscious of it. We're fat, we're ugly, we're tall, we're short, we're th thin, and so on. We have crooked nose, crooked teeth. Our hair is the wrong color, our hair is, and so on, and so on. Our ears are too big, whatever. Anything and everything. And so looking at, watching a body die, imagine watching a body decompose in front of your eyes. Kind of puts a damper on all that, and puts it all in perspective when you start to say, really, why am I so obsessed with this useless body that's going to get old, sick and die? That's like a burden, like a corpse around one's neck. And so the Buddha began to teach her, and he taught a verse that is not the verse that we have, but it's a bunch of verses actually. Let's read, let's look at the, the Pali is quite beautiful, but I won't bore you with it. Uh, oh, it's actually quite good. As is this body, uh, first he talks about the body is diseased, impure, putrid. It oozes and leaks, yet it is desired of simpletons. As is the, this body, so also was that. Yatha idang tatha etang, yatha etang tatha idang. That body, as that body, uh, no, as, as this body, so is that body. As that body, so is this body. We are like them. This is what the Buddha was teaching to her. Basically, what I sort of thing I was just saying, in, but in much more words. Not quite as well as the Buddha. Behold the elements in their emptiness. Mm -hmm. Dhatuto sunyato pasa. Look at these elements that are empty. Behold the emptiness of the elements. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That the element, the emptiness of the elements, means that there is no, there is no essence. There is nothing. Um, there's nothing imperm there's nothing permanent, nothing that is a thing, right? Because change means it's not ac it can't actually be a, a real thing. What would it mean to say that something changes? It's not actually a thing anymore. It's just a process. And that's what the body is. This body is not a thing, it's a process. And the Buddha says as much. He says, um, Oh, there's one more malokang punaragami go not back to the world hmm. cast away desire for existence and you shall walk in tranquility bhave chandang virajitva upasanto charisati don't know where this verse comes from this is apparently something the Buddha said but it's not canonical I don't think At any rate, then the Buddha, the Buddha says what, um, the idea that there's no sara, imasming sarire saro ati, ma sanyankari. Don't, don't create the conception in your mind that there is anything of any, that, that there is any essence or importance or value to the body. Apapatakopihi eta saro nati. The smallest bit of uh, of essence or importance in this body does not exist. Nati. It is made up of three hundred bones, smeared and plastered with blood and flesh and skin and so on. And then he gave the verse. 
So, how this relates to our practice should be fairly clear in two ways. The first is the first is the second part of the verse here, where it says "mano mako jaohido yatajara." Actually, it's you know the, the the verse what the verse explicitly states that we become conceited and attached to the body. This is an important lesson. It's an important um, delusion to dispel because the body is certainly not worth clinging to, being uh, conceited about, attached to, desirous of, and so on. It being something that's not going to last, that it's not going to, that's not stable, that can never be a source of true happiness. But the more important lesson, I think actually, surprisingly, really comes from the story, not from the verse. But it's implicit in the verse, and it's the more um, ultimate reality of impermanent suffering and non-self. This idea of seeing things arise and cease that comes on a conceptual level from, from seeing old age, sickness and death, but it can also be seen, or it needs eventually to be seen on a momentary level. And the true way to understand the nature of the body and to free yourself from any kind of attachment to it really is the practice of insight meditation. It's all fine and good to look at a corpse and, and to gain the, the uh, profound seeming um, appreciation for the impermanence of the body, but it's a, quite another thing to actually see momentary arising and ceasing experience and to, to realize that the body doesn't exist in the first place. And all that there is is this process. And to see how disconnected from that reality is our perception, where we perceive the body as being beautiful, which could never be a part of the process. Um, how we see, conceive the body as being strong, as, as being solid, as being me and mine. And all of that has no place in reality, which is changing constantly in moments and moments of experience. challenge to us and it's a part of it's an important subject to talk about to realize and because as we talk about we are able to see to talk about it we're able to see and, and experience our attachments to the body and it's a challenge to to strive to understand this you know? what is where it why why the disconnect, or to see through the disconnect, whereby we think of something as beautiful, attractive, me, mine, worthy of possessing or possessed by me, controlled by me, etc. With the, the, the disconnect between that and the reality, whereby it's none of that, where it's quite clearly it doesn't even exist. A lot of our practice is like this, it's about bridging the, the disconnect between our perception and reality where eventually our view of things comes in line and, and, and can change radically as a result comes in, in line as it comes in line with the with the truth with the, with what's really going on and of course that that's very much why we suffer we suffer because of the disconnect if you understood reality clearly there'd be no reason to suffer, there'd be no opportunity for suffering to arise. So, it's not something to be, uh, even though this is sort of a conceptual teaching, it's not something to be disregarded or discounted. Because we have the, and this is what we're born with, we're born with conceit, and we're born into a life of conceit and attachment to the body. And so it's one of the more important topics to talk about the true nature of the body, both conceptually and in an ultimate sense. Conceptually as getting old, sick, and dying. And in an ultimate sense as not really existing in the first place. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all good practice.